And I agree with you as far as up and down the line, you look at measures in the bond market and you could argue that <clears throat> it is somewhat dysfunctional. Whether you look at realized volatility, look at what's happening in the bond market right now. The, you know, we could go 24 hour periods with 20 basis point moves in the bond market. Uh, Pre-COVID, the 20 basis point move was like, like you know, a special show on CNBC with no commercials for an hour. Oh, my God, look what's <laughs> happened in the bond market. Now it happens twice a week, and no one notices anymore that the bond market does this. Measures of bond market implied volatility like the move have not hit all-time highs, but have been in the upper 5% of the numbers we've seen in the last 30 years, equal to where they were in the spring of 2020. So the you know the total return losses I've tweeted that chart out many times is at an all time record for 2022 um, for the bond market. So it is not in a good place. I would nuance what you said that you know things break. I've I've said things have already broken. The bond market you might argue is broken. I would argue argue that the energy markets might be broken as well too with the way that they trade. Um, the stock market might have already broken. It already had a 20 percent correction. So it's maybe it's not that the Fed raises rates until things until something breaks, which was the old line. It's the Fed will keep raising rates till enough things break because we've already broken some things. Hi, everyone. Mike Lua here, macro analyst with Real Vision. I hope you all really enjoyed that video between Jim and Joseph because it was packed with a ton of great information. But before we get into the key takeaways, I do want to provide a little background on myself. For the past 12 years, I've spent my career in the hedge fund industry across various different strategies. Most recently, in addition to my role here at Real Vision, I run an independent macro research firm as well as a discretionary macro hedge fund. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I think it gives a good glimpse into the way that I view the world and it will help you kind of understand my takeaways from both Jim and Joseph's conversation as well as the Fed today. If we look at the market reaction following today's press conference, we can see the following. Equities were higher, the dollar was lower, commodities were higher, high yield credit spreads contracted, and the yield curve actually steepened a bit. What does this all mean? Essentially, this reaction tells you that the market interpreted Powell's comments as being slightly dovish. But is that really his intention? And I think that's key to understanding what Joseph and Jim were talking about in their conversation, because it doesn't sound like Joseph really buys into that narrative. So let's talk about what Powell actually said. As Joseph pointed out, it sounded an awful lot like Powell was trying to prepare the economy and the market for the inevitable recession. He talked about a slowdown in demand and said that was both what the Fed expected and wanted. Now, is that enough to really slow inflation? Well, that remains to be seen. As Paul mentioned, it's going to take several periods of below trend growth to really achieve those goals that the Fed wanted. Within his comments, there were quite a few contradictions. And I think it's important to point out those contradictions because the Fed did something very important today. What they did is they essentially removed forward guidance by saying they weren't gonna be as clear about the path forward as they were in their path to getting to neutral. So the natural outcome of that should be elevated volatility. And as my colleague Roger Hurst pointed out yesterday, more uncertainty in the market and more of a data dependence going forward should introduce a lot more volatility into asset prices. As Jim and Joseph pointed out in their video, we may be entering into a period of good news is bad news or bad news is good news. Do we know how the market's going to react to each and every data point? Uh, we don't. And that's really where the volatility is going to come through in asset prices because while we think we know what the market wants to see, it's really a guessing game in terms of how it will be interpreted moving forward. But going back to those contradictions that Powell made throughout his press conference, you know, he did say that he didn't believe we were in a recession or immediately heading for a recession. But he also said that there's a noticeable slowdown in expenditures, consumer discretionary spending. Um, you know, it, offsetting that, he did bring up the fact that the labor market was extremely strong. Now, I do want to point out a slight discrepancy in, in the data there because while he talks about the job gains that we've seen over the past several months, 
if we look at the household surveys of those in the labor force, we've actually seen a slight decline since the month of March. So, you know, is the labor market really as strong as Powell suggested in his press conference, or are we starting to see early signs of the weakening labor market? And that's really key because, you know, Joseph points out some really super interesting things um, during this discussion. And it's really a, a viewpoint that I haven't heard before, but I think it's fascinating for us to think about moving forward. As Jim and Joseph talked about, the market seemed to interpret the removal of for forward guidance as sort of a sign that, you know, we're approaching or getting close to that point of a Fed pivot. Is that really a good bet to be making? Well, in Joseph's opinion, inflation is going to be stickier and higher for longer. What that means is that the Fed's rates are going to have to be possibly higher than the 3.5% rate that they're projecting, um, or they at least have to stay higher for longer. So in other words, we may not be looking for an immediate pivot back towards rate cuts. How does this translate for the equity market? Well, the equity market certainly had been looking towards that pivot. That's been a big theme and narrative in the recent rebound in equity prices. And we saw that in a bit of a follow through today. Now, as I talked about before, in terms of the market reaction, it's a bit counterintuitive if we think about things because the market's reaction today actually goes against what the Fed actually wants. The Fed wants slower growth, wants slower demand. They want to see a slowdown in economic activity. If we're seeing conditions unfold after the press conference, whether that was Paul's intention or not, you know, on the surface, it seemed like he was trying to talk tough on inflation. And, you know, he made a few comments to that effect where if we let inflation remain too high for too long, it creates more severe issues down the road. And he emphatic emphatically stated, we have to deal with this right now. But if the market reaction following today's press conference is one where financial conditions actually loosen, you know, dollar weaker, commodities higher, credit spreads um, actually contract, then that's actually not what the Fed wants. That's a loosening financial conditions, which actually doesn't have that sort of translation effect into slower demand. Now, of course, this is all just one day's reaction or really two hours worth of reaction after the Fed. And as Jim pointed out, there's been this sort of consistent behavior over the past few Fed meetings. Um, and if we pull up the chart here of the S&P 500, we can show that in the days leading up to or even after the Fed meeting, equity markets have tended to rally in response to the Fed's decision. But another consistent theme coming after these rallies has been sort of the market's underestimating the Fed's hawkishness. In other words, the continued tightening in liquidity has ultimately resumed a more downward pressure on equity prices. And this is key because, um, as Jim and Joseph point out, Bill Dudley had an op-ed piece where he talked about the Fed needing to essentially crash stock prices or lower the equity market. And this goes to Joseph's point where Consumers really finance their spending, which has been remained relatively robust, through three main ways. That is through wages, that is through credit, and that's through wealth. So again, if the market's interpreting the Fed as being more dovish or getting close to that point of a pivot, and they're already starting to loosen financial conditions, then the Fed may not be getting the intended effect that they wanted by raising rates by 75 basis points, which, you know, by most measures is pretty aggressive. And that brings me to another point. If we think about the broader landscape of inflation, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the, the larger narrative that demographics and long-term demographic trends point towards lower growth potential. That's been the view for a lot of people that have been betting on a return to deflation in terms of lower long-term growth potential will ultimately lead to long lower long-term inflation and long-term bond yields. But Joseph presents a really compelling argument here, and it's something that I think we should all consider. And that is, while that may be true in terms of demand for goods and services, in terms of the, the demographic picture, it also applies to labor supply. You see, if labor supply 
is shrinking in terms of the prime age working population, while the older generations are living longer, meaning they're consuming more for more years, then there's sort of this mismatch in the labor market. The Fed has continuously pointed to this, that you know they've been disappointed that there hasn't been more uptake in the labor market or there still appears to be this mismatch. But that does raise a lot of questions in terms of, can wage growth persist for longer than the Fed expects, which ultimately, in Joseph's opinion, will lead to more sustained inflation. As he mentioned earlier in the conversation, it's hard for inflation to fall back down to 2%, which is the Fed's stated goal, if wages are still growing at 5% due to the structural imbalance in the labor market. Now, of course, we may see an easing from 9% back down to 5%, but still, that's not consistent with the Fed's long-term goal of 2%. Ultimately, this feeds into Joseph's view that rates will need to go either go higher above the 3.5% that the Fed is currently projecting, or at least remain at these elevated levels for longer than the market is currently pricing in. And let's quickly reiterate what Joseph and Jim pointed out about the market's pricing of the Fed's path moving forward. While the equity market has certainly cheered on the reduction in the path of the Fed's expected path, uh, it's important that we remember that they're simply opinions or as Jim stated, they're simply opinions and they have a terrible track record at, at predicting where the Fed funds and inflation will both end up in the future. Are people underestimating the labor issues? You know, besides the point that Joseph made about the structural differences, Jim did have a good point about the change in consumer demand due to the shift in uh, work habits. So coming out of the pandemic, people's work habits changed. Not as many people are traveling into the office, and that's led to a huge surge in suburban housing demand. That housing demand has been also accompanied by the purchase of goods needed to fill up those homes. That surge in demand has then translated into more supply chain bottlenecks that, in the Fed's own words, they severely underestimated. You see, I think the key thing to understand here, and, and remember as we're making our decisions moving forward, is that Uncertainty is the key here, whether we're talking about the Fed's own decision making, which in Powell's view is part of the reason they removed forward guidance, because they simply, they're admitting that they don't understand things and the outlook is uncertain. In the market's view, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty surrounding what the Fed will do because the Fed has removed that forward guidance. All of that uncertainty will ultimately translate into higher volatility. Now, if you're a trader, whether it's short term or, or a swing trader, that could be a great environment for you. But if you're an investor, it's important that you recognize the sort of environments that we're in. If we're going to be in these ele elevated periods of volatility where we're having lots of back and forth because one good print might be viewed as bad news or one bad print might be viewed as good news, the emotional toll that it will take on investors may not be worth it. If you're a long-term investor, you have plenty of time to put capital to work once things settle down and we have a clearer picture of how things would move forward. And that brings me to my final point in summing up Jim and Joseph's comments, as well as the, the market's reaction to the Fed's press conference today. Outside of the structural differences that we might be looking at in terms of inflation, whether the market is right or wrong and predicting where the Fed will go, and the uncertainty that the Fed is contributing by removing forward guidance, there is this looming issue of the Fed's quantitative tightening actions. As Joseph pointed out, it's not necessarily a shift in the amount of treasuries, it's just a shift in the composition of the owners. So as the Fed lets treasuries roll off their balance sheet, these treasuries will ultimately need to be purchased by private investors or other sovereign investors. Now, the key here is that sovereigns and individual or private investors are price sensitive, whereas the Federal Reserve is not. The Fed can keep buying no matter what price it is, and it really doesn't matter. For private investors, they need to see some sort of return on their investment. And so the question becomes, at what point does that become attractive to sort of suck capital away from other areas of the market, whether it's credit or equities, 
um, and into the fixed income market to sort of plug this hole. So, you know, that goes to Joseph's point in terms of if the Fed really truly be believes that it's going to continue on this QT path for the next two years, that is just yet another factor that could ultimately break things. And, you know, the scary part, if you will, is it could come in what's deemed as one of the most liquid and safe markets uh, in the entire world. Um, but again, that sort of contributes to the overall volatility. If bond volatility is going to remain elevated because there's this tug of war in terms of increased supply, as well as a private investor needing a certain return on an investment, then that's ultimately going to translate into other asset prices, whether it's foreign exchange, equities, or even credit. So I think the biggest takeaways from, from today are, one, as Roger Hurst pointed out yesterday, volatility is likely here to stay for quite a long time. But beyond that, for you as an individual, whether it's an investor or you in your everyday life, is we could be looking at periods of higher interest rates for longer, whether that means maybe cutting back on some discretionary spending so that you have more of a nest egg in terms of if we are heading for a true recession, or simply being more patient with your investments and letting the dust settle so that you're not frustrating and chopping yourself up with a bunch of losses. So I hope you guys enjoyed this recap. Um, I really love the conversation between Jim and Joseph today. I found it truly fascinating. And uh, thanks for tuning in for the takeaways. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.